Good morning, church. How's your week been? Good? Thanks, Adam. How was my week? Let me move this away from everybody. I didn't think I have any lungs left. I think I've been coughing like crazy. I thought... I usually ask the Lord, if you're going to get me sick, get me sick at the beginning of the week so I'll be ready to go by Sunday. i got to be more specific. Help me to get sick Sunday after I preach so that I really have enough time to get better. I am on the, on the mend. My throat is still weak, so Wayne's going to be adjusting this volume level when I get really, really soft-spoken. But I had a, I had a hard week. Well, church, do we care about Jesus? The answer is yes. That's why hopefully you're here. I love the songs we've been singing. We're here for you. I believe, right? I believe. You believe Jesus is coming again? Yeah, that he rose from the dead. He's coming again. And he's Lord of all. He's over all I know. Well, church, we're in Luke chapter 10. If you have a Bible, I'd ask you to turn there, and if you don't have a Bible, grab one in the seat in front of you, turn to the back, which is the New Testament, to page 54, and you'll find Luke chapter 10. This is a continuation of last week's sermon, or message, when Jesus sent 70 out. Now he's the 70 return. Jesus understood the power of internship. Back in the early 80s, I was finishing up my mathematics degree at Trenton State College. It's in New Jersey. It's called the College of New Jersey today. And one of the classes I needed to take to graduate was an internship in a classroom of a math teacher. And so I was assigned to the Pennsbury School District in Pennsylvania and I came into this class of junior hires, and I'm supposed to observe this class for two months, and then maybe the teacher would allow me to start teaching some of their classes. Well, my teacher followed that rule not at all. He gave me one week to observe how he does things. Then he sat me down, gave me the lesson plans, and said, you're the teacher from now to the end of the semester. He was in the classroom, but I was a teacher. Oh, the joy of teaching junior high boys and girls. A subject they all love, mathematics. But it was a practicum. And there's power in having these internships. See, learning occurs best when you have practical experience linked with classroom study. That's why Jesus sent out his 12 disciples in Luke chapter 9. They've been watching him, and now he sends them out to do the same things that he did. What did he do? He cast out demons. He healed the sick. He proclaimed the kingdom of God. And so he sends them out in Luke chapter 9. Now in Luke chapter 10, he sends out 70 more. Or maybe your version says 72, depending on which text, Greek text you're looking at. But anyway, 70 or 72, to have that same kind of experience. Heal the sick. Proclaim the kingdom of God. And now they've come back. So let's start reading in verse 17. The 70, or 72, returned with joy, saying, Lord... Even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. At that very time, or that very hour, He rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, 
I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things which you see. For I say to you, that many prophets and kings wished to see the things which you see and did not see them, and to hear the things which you hear and did not hear them. So let's stop and ask the Lord for guidance on this passage. Lord, we just got done reading the word. We know it's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. We know that it's the inspired word. It's God-breathed, and therefore it's very profitable for us. So, Lord, make this word profitable for us this morning. We pray this in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. Eight times in these, well, not eight times. See, I'm on such heavy medication, I'm going to be saying things backwards today. Four times in these eight verses. The word joy or rejoicing occurs. In verse 17, they returned with joy. In verse 20, the word rejoice is recorded twice. And in verse 21, Jesus prays when he rejoices greatly in the Holy Spirit. So using joy and rejoicing as kind of the theme, the title of this service is called, or sermon, is called The Joy of Service. And as followers of Jesus, we have many reasons for rejoicing. We have many reasons for rejoicing. The first reason in our text is this. We have authority over the demonic. We have authority over the demonic. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Now, If you look at chapter 10, verses 1 through 16, Jesus didn't tell them to cast out demons. He told them to heal the sick and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, he told cast out the demons to the disciples in Luke chapter 9, but not so much in Luke chapter 10, and yet they had this ability. They returned rejoicing that the demons were subject to them in Jesus' name. Notice what they didn't say. Lord, most of the homes received us gladly when we knocked on the doors. And they let us in. And they took care of us. Lord, there were some homes that rejected us. They rejected your message. They slammed the door in our face. No, they don't say anything about that. Notice they also didn't say, Lord, we healed many who were sick. And now we saw them get well. They're healthy. No, they didn't say that. Notice that they didn't say, Lord, we proclaim the kingdom of God. And many now believe that you are the Messiah. That you're the king of God's kingdom. No, they didn't rejoice in that. The 70 rejoiced in their victory over the demonic that they had authority over the demonic. Now, the 70 are part of the large crowd of disciples, and they all saw Jesus cast out demons out of people. But now it became clear to them that they had the same ability. They were experiencing God's kingdom in the present, being stronger than whose kingdom? Satan's kingdom. But don't miss the phrase in your name. Now, this is not some kind of magical incantation that we can go up to people, cast out demons, because we say, now, in the name of Jesus, be gone. In your name means in your power, Lord, in your power. See, the 70 didn't personally have authority over the demonic, but in the power of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, they did. 
It's his power. It's his authority that gave them this authority. Ephesians 6.10 says that we are to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And the rest of Ephesians 6 goes on to say that, you know, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against what? Well, the spiritual forces of this world, the evil forces. And we're to wear the full armor of God. But we don't fight in our power. We fight in whose power? The Lord Jesus Christ. And only those with a personal relationship with Jesus as king have the right to ex exercise this authority. Recall what happened in Acts chapter 19 when certain men tried to cast out demons in the name of Jesus? These were the seven sons of Sceva. Here's what it says. But also some of the Jewish exorcists, meaning they're casting out demons, who went from place to place, attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits, the demons, in whose name? The name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom the Apostle Paul preaches. They don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. He says, you tell the demons, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And seven sons of one Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. And the evil spirit, demon, he answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you? When a demon talks to you like that, you better be careful. You better be fearful. And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. I would say this was an exorcism that didn't go very well. And this became known to all, both Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus. And fear fell upon them all. And the name of who? The Lord Jesus was being magnified. Only those with a personal relationship with Jesus as king have any business dealing with the demonic. So my warning for you is don't try this at home unless you're walking in the power of the Spirit. Well, Jesus responded to their joy with what I'm calling an observation and a promise. What's the observation? He says, I was watching Satan fall from heaven. <coughs> Excuse me. Is this figurative or literal? Is it figurative for Satan's kingdom has just been dealt a severe blow? signifying uh, as the kingdom of God grows, his kingdom is going to be shrinking? Possibly. But I think it could also be rather literal. See, the word heaven in Greek is the word also for sky. It could be either sky or heaven. And in Ephesians 2, 2, who's called the prince of the power of the air? Satan is. The prince of of the power of the air. And when it sounds like lightning, it means the quickness, the suddenness of his coming now. And so is it possible that Satan fell from the sky rather quickly to investigate why all of a sudden his kingdom started losing its power? It was now facing setbacks. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And so Satan's checking it out. I kind of tend to think that's the reason. But look at his promise in verse 19. I have given you authority. And then he says, authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. Okay, let's stop again. Or is this literal or is this figurative? 
Well, Bob, you just got done saying that the other one probably might be literal. And now you're going to turn the tables and say this one's more figurative? Well, if it's literal, it means that we have the power to stand on serpents and scorpions, right? So next week, we're going to have a box of snakes up here. <laughs> Are there churches that handle snakes? Do they take it from this text? Yeah, and also from Mark 16. But I don't know of any churches that have scorpion handling services. Let's grab some of these scorpions and put them on you and handle them. I don't know of any of them that do that. They don't, do, they don't mind the snake part, but not the scorpion part. So really, I think this is more figurative. That's the serpents and the scorpions refer symbolically to something evil, deadly, to Satan's kingdom. And the next phrase actually gives us this confirmation when it says, the authority is really over all the power of the enemy. Who's the enemy? We know that is Satan's kingdom. And then Jesus goes on with the promise, not only will you have authority, but nothing will injure you. Now the you in verse 19, we read it, and we always apply you's personally, but that's really in the plural. And so in verse 19, I have given you, plural you, and nothing will injure you, plural you. Who is he talking to? Well, who just came back? It's the 70. It's the 70 who just returned. So I get, ask you the question, do we then have the authority in Jesus' name to cast out demons because of that you? Most of casting out demons occurred by Jesus and his disciples in the Gospels. I misspoke by saying that in the rest of Scripture, you don't find people casting out demons. And then the Lord pricked me in my heart later and said, did you forget about Acts chapter 8? Because in Acts chapter 8, Philip was casting out demons. And so I said, yes, Lord, I forgot about Acts chapter 8. So first service, I misspoke. So go tell them that. Are we to be going around casting out of demons out of people? Well, what about if the person's demonized and they don't want you to cast it out? Do you have the right to go up to them in the power, in the name of Jesus Christ, to cast out that demon? Maybe they are willing to have you cast it out. Is this saying that we should go to the dark places in this world, to India and Nepal, where there is this evilness and go into that evilness and start casting demons out of people? I'm not sure this is what Jesus is getting at here. I can say this definitively, that every believer in Jesus Christ, we are to resist the devil, right? James chapter 4, verse 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The scripture is pretty clear that we are to stand firm against the devil and his evil forces. In Ephesians 6, 11 through 14, three times it says, stand firm against the enemy. But to go around casting out demons, we might have that authority. But unless you know the Lord is definitely telling you to get involved, I'd be a little leery. And I would never get involved if you're not walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not walking in the power of the Spirit, you have no business going against the demonic. Unless you like what happened to the sons of Sceva. Anyway, they came back rejoicing that they had authority over the demonic. But see, another reason we have for rejoicing is what's found in verse 20 we have our names recorded in glory. Jesus, after he gives that promise, he now kind of redirects their focus for joy. Jesus said, do not rejoice that the spirits or demons are subject to you, 
but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. And the word rejoice is in the present tense, it's an imperative, it's a command, meaning be constantly rejoicing. Be constantly rejoicing that your names are where? Recorded, written down in heaven. When you reflect on your salvation, it should always cause you to rejoice. Because you were once dead in your trespasses and sins. How alive were you? Well, you were physically alive, but spiritually dead. You were dead. And it's only by God's grace that he made you alive. You had no way of saving yourself. So God sent his son named Jesus, who lived that perfect life so he could be a perfect sacrifice on the cross. And Jesus died in your place on the cross to bear the penalty of your sin and my sin. And simply through coming to the cross, confessing that we are sinners, and putting our faith in Jesus as our Savior, not only are our sins forgiven, but you are adopted into God's family. Is that a cause for rejoicing? No matter what else may be going on in your life, you always have a reason to rejoice because when you look at the cross, you see who? Jesus. And the moment you put your faith in Jesus, your name is written down in heaven. The scriptures talk about the book of life. I put those scriptures in your notes. Most of them come from Revelation. But here's one from the Pauline epistles in Philippians chapter 4, verse 3. Paul says, Indeed, true comrade, I ask you also to help these women, the women in verse 2 who are not getting along, who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in what? The book of life. Is there a book of life? Yeah. In Revelation 13, 8, it says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him. The him is the beast or the antichrist. And everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. Who is the Lamb who was slain? Jesus. Oftentimes it's called the Lamb's book of life. We have a reason for rejoicing. Our names are written down in the Lamb's book of life. There are some hymns that... I used to sing in my Baptist days when I was growing up in a Baptist church. Here's what one says. I got to take some water before I start singing this to you. <laughs> I was once a sinner, but I came. Pardon to receive from my Lord. This was freely given, and I found that he always kept his word. Anybody know this song? Let me read you the second verse. I was humbly kneeling at the cross, fearing naught but God's angry frown. When the heavens opened, then I saw that my name was written down. In the book tis written, saved by grace, oh, the joy that came to my soul. Now I am forgiven, and I know by the blood I am made whole. Anybody know the song yet? Here's the chorus. Now you'll know it. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. And the white-robed angels sing the story. Well, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if the angels wear white robes. But they sing, a sinner has come home. For there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Anybody know that song now? No. You're, you weren't Baptist. <laughs> what about this song? 
when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Is your name written down in glory? Is it on the roll? Only if you place your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Is that a reason for rejoicing? Jesus says, don't rejoice that the spirits are subject to you. Rejoice that your name is written down. We should just end right here, right? Save my voice. Let's end right here. Well, I'll just speed through the rest of the notes because I don't want to talk very much. So give, let me give you the third reason why each of us should live a life of rejoicing. We have this awesome privilege of knowing God as no one else does. We have the awesome privilege of knowing God as no one else does. In verse 21, Jesus now breaks out in a prayer, and he's rejoicing greatly in the Holy Spirit. And he's praying a prayer of praise. It says at that very time or that very hour, it's linking everything that went before with what he's praying now. And Jesus gave praise because God, the Father, he hides and reveals as he wishes. Look at 21. He says, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth that you have hidden these things. What's he hiding? He's hiding these things from the wise and the intelligent and has revealed these things to infants. What are these things he's talking about? In the context, it has to talk about the kingdom of God and who's king? the Messiah named Jesus. See, the wise and the intelligent are those people who slammed the door on the 70 when they came to proclaim the kingdom. We don't believe any of that stuff. The wise and intelligent are the religious leaders of Jesus' day who rejected Jesus as king, as the Christ. In John 7, verse 48, I read this yesterday. In John 7, 48, Jesus was speaking in John 7, and the Pharisees, the rulers, sent these guys out to arrest him. And they came back and said, well, why didn't you arrest him? And they say, well, we've never heard anybody speak like this man speaks. And in verse 48, one of the rulers says, no one of the rulers or Pharisees has believed in him, has he? Meaning that the wise and the intelligent ones, they don't believe in Jesus as the Christ. And then Nicodemus stands up for Jesus by saying, hey, we don't judge people unless we first hear them, do we? Are there wise and intelligent people today who refuse to accept Jesus? Who refuse to accept him as Savior? Refuse to accept him as king? refused to accept him as God's son. Yet God was pleased to reveal these things to who? Infants. Who are the infants in the passage? It's the ones he sent out, the 70. Likewise, we're called the infants because we believe this. At least you sang it, we believe this. We're the infants. God was well pleased to reveal this to the infants. God's well pleased to save the nobodies of this world. Remember what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 26. He's writing to the believers, the men and women, boys and girls who put their faith in Jesus. He says, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, according to human standards. There were not many mighty, not many noble. 
But God has chosen the foolish things of the world. I don't like this. He's calling me what? He's kind of he's calling me kind of the foolish thing of the world. To shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world. To shame the things which are strong. And the base things, or the humble things of the world. And the despised, God has chosen. He has chosen the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are. So that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, who's doing? God's doing. By God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Christ means Messiah. You are in Christ Jesus. Who, meaning Christ, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts will boast in who? In the Lord. He's chosen us. The foolish things, the weak things. And yet because he's chosen us and placed us in Christ, we now have the wisdom from God. It's righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So that our boasting is not in our abilities, but in who? Jesus. God was pleased to reveal these things to the infants. Jesus also gave praise because God the Father has handed all things over to him. Verse 22. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. This is what Jesus spoke right before he gave the Great Commission. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. In Matthew 28, 18. God the Father has handed all things over to Jesus. How many things were handed over? All things. And notice the progression in this verse. No one knows who the Son is. No one knows really who Jesus is except the Father. And no one knows who the Father is except the Son. I have many of you fooled thinking I'm a real righteous man. But you know who knows that's false more than anybody else? Don't go with my wife because this is a father-son analogy, okay? I have three sons. My sons know. My sons know that in public, in the church, sometimes I act one way, but behind closed doors in the house, sometimes I act differently. It shouldn't be this way, but I'm a man of flesh. I'm a man with a sinful nature, and sometimes I allow this. Put your hands down. I didn't ask others to show who's sinful. <laughs> Thanks, James, for standing up with me. I'm a sinner saved by grace, and my sons know intimately when I've been very selfish, when I've been condemning, when I've been harsh and critical with my words, where I could have been more affirming and I wasn't. See, your children know you better than everybody else knows you. And the text here is saying that who knows Jesus better than anybody else? God the Father. Who knows God the Father better than anybody else? God the Son. God only knows God intimately and thoroughly. And here's the good news at the end of verse 22. Jesus, the Son, wills to reveal his Father to us. Isn't that good? No one knows who the Father is except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal What's God the Father like? I say, look at the Son. Jesus said to Philip in John 14, 9, He who has seen me has seen the Father. 
Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, talks about Jesus, that he's the exact representation of the Father. And praise the Lord, Jesus, God the Son, wills to reveal that to us. Isn't that good news? I think it's a reason for rejoicing. And then lastly, God the Son blessed his disciples for all that they've experienced in verses 23 and 24. He now turns to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I say to you that many prophets and kings wished to see the things which you see and did not see them, and to hear the things which you hear and did not hear them. Do you realize that the Old Testament prophets and kings wished to see and hear everything that Christ's disciples got to see and hear? They wanted to see this day, this time period. So let me ask you, how much more are we blessed? Now that we have the finished product of the inspired word of God. Because does this tell us about God? Does it show us the Son? Does it tell us about the Spirit? We have the finished product of the inspired word of God. And how much more blessed are we that we have the Holy Spirit that lives within us? In the Old Testament times, did people have the Holy Spirit living within them? No, the Holy Spirit came upon some people for certain periods of time, but they never had the Spirit of God indwell them. Because of Jesus Christ, we have the Spirit of God living within to teach us from the Word to guide us, to empower us, to live according to the word of God. Jesus said this about the advantages of the Spirit in John 16. In verse 7, he tells his own disciples, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, here it's the Holy Spirit, will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, pause for emphasis and a drink of water. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, what's he going to do? He's going to guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever the spirit hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He, the Spirit, will glorify me, Jesus says, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Father, Son, and Spirit, we in this day and age, do you realize how blessed we are that we have the Godhead, all three persons of the Godhead, helping us every day. Sometimes when I read the Old Testament, I think, oh, I'd love to live at that time. To see King David, Solomon, Josiah, Hezekiah, some of these kings. But you know, they wish to be at Jesus' day. And we have the benefit of the whole word of God that we know what happened during Jesus' day, and now we have the Spirit with us today. It's a reason to rejoice. As Christians, we are to be a rejoicing people. Are you? But you know, sometimes as Christians, we often rejoice in a number of things other than the main thing. What's the main thing? Verse 20, at the end. Rejoice that your names are are recorded in heaven. Isn't that the main thing that Jesus is saying here? Don't rejoice over your proclaiming the gospel. Don't rejoice over the fact you can heal the sick. Don't rejoice primarily that you can cast out demons. Now, all those things should be a reason for rejoicing, right? They are, but it's not the main thing. What's the main thing? Your names are recorded in heaven. One of the commentaries I read is by a man named R. Kent Hughes. 
He was a pastor of the college church in Wheaton, Illinois. You know, Wheaton College has this college church. And he was the pastor there from 1979 to 2006. This is what he wrote. If you are rich, do not rejoice in your wealth, because your riches will fly away. Instead, rejoice that your name is written in heaven. If you are a person of learning, thank God for it and use it to his glory. But do not make it your source of joy. Rather, rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Do you have a position of leadership in Christ's church? Thank God and glorify him in it, but rejoice first that your name is in the book of life. Do you have great gifts from the Spirit? Are you a meteor among many stars? Has God used you? Is he using you now? Fine, but rejoice first and foremost in this. Your name is written in heaven. Do we agree? Amen. Is your name written down in heaven? Is your name written down in heaven? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin and said, Lord, you are the king of God's kingdom and you're king of me as well? Have you by faith placed your trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Father, we come before you thanking you for salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. He suffered, bled, and died to pay for our sins. Thank you that we can become your child, God, simply through belief in, our, in your son's name. Lord, if there's anyone here that has not had their name written down in glory, may today be a day of humbling that they surrender to Jesus Christ and receive him as their Savior. And for us who have received Jesus Christ, may we live a life of rejoicing because of the main thing. Our names are written down in heaven. Thank you for this grace. In Jesus, your Savior, our Savior's name we pray.